Thank you, Ron, and thank you, Chad, uh, for providing the framework for this panel discussion and giving us uh, a lot to think about. Want to welcome Nani, James, and Chris um, for what I hope will be a good dialogue and a good discussion. So let me start by um, just asking each of you to um, comment briefly on how um, Ron's presentation resonated with you. What, what key points did you take out of it? Um, what are the lessons we can learn? And what do you see as the big challenges in making uh, the balance that, that Ron, both Ron and Chad talked about? Right. Who would like to start? Chris. <laughs> uh, well, uh, it's a great opportunity to do it and uh, honored to be part of the discussion today and congratulations to Chad and Rennie and all the whole team for continuing to really set an important, I think, metronome for where um, uh, education in Massachusetts is and can go. Um, I was also thinking last night about uh, Jack Rennie, uh, who, for whom it's named, and. Uh, what he would make of where we are in education last night, you know, at this point in history, many of you may know he was sort of the business uh, person who was behind a lot of the energy in 1993 to pass the Education Reform Act. Uh, so uh, a, a lot of water under the, uh, over the over the dam or under the bridge or whatever it is. <laughs> Later, here we are. Um, well, from the point of view of the Board of Higher Education, one thing I want to comment on that really jumps off to me, and it happens to be this area of research uh, is one of personal interest to me, and to have talked about it here at a Rennie Center event not long ago. Um, uh, and I think, you know, Ron, your work from since many years now of really laying the grounds of people appreciating both the value of student voice organized in a pretty comprehensive way and the intersection between understanding what's going on with teachers' behavior in the classroom and what's going on with students the bubble over the student's head uh, that's so critical to do is you know, incredibly valuable. And I think it's Massachusetts is perhaps positioned as well or better than any state in the country to, to take advantage of the insights that have been learned from your work and others um, at this juncture. So uh, we're rich in resources as a state. Uh, we've been very focused at the Board of Higher Education on, on uh, this remedial education issue. And I think uh, I'm going to editorialize slightly uh, because I think that uh, it, what we're learning in real time, we just talked about it at the Academic Affairs Committee the other day, uh, about a pilot that's been going on for the last couple of years, I think really connects with the points you're making, Ron. And, and, and what we, we've been, the, st the, the State Board of educa Higher Education, before I got involved, uh, decided to uh, try an experiment to let campuses take different approaches to which students were placed into college level math. Before that point, you had to take the Accuplayers to test. If you didn't get a high enough score, you had to go into remediation. And overwhelmingly, that was kind of a death sentence to your outcome from college. Um, and there were two kind of approaches to thinking about that problem. One was, we need better remedial math, or we need better high school math, or you know, it's about the math skills. The other is, was, and apparently widely shared at a lot of the campuses as well, that what exactly is Accuplace for measuring and not measuring? So the state allowed campuses to experiment, and one of the main experiments has been letting students who have a 2.7 GPA and have taken a certain number of courses of math in high school to proceed into that uh, math course, that college math course, regardless of their Accuplacer results. And it's way too early to understand what all the outflow of that is, and it's incredibly important we do a rigorous job of it. But the interesting outcome is students admitted into, develop, into college level math by that route do as well as students who were admitted through the Accuplacer route. To be clear, students who would not have been in that math course are passing at the, if you just looked at Accuplacer, are in fact passing at the same rate. Now that's not surprising to me, given my research interest in this area of non-cognitive skills, because one thing that has been sort of a challenge to thinking about standardized test scores for a while has been the fact that grades are a better predictor of college completion to begin with. This is really well known. How can grades, crappy psychometric, uh, properties, right? Different teachers give different grades on different standards. How can it possibly be better than pure, beautiful standardized tests for predicting outcomes? And the answer, of course, is 
they have cognitive and non-cognitive components. Teachers give students who try hard, who meet, what was it, uh, not Kristen, but or Kristen, you have to decide. <laughs> but the other fellow, what was his name? Uh, Jarrell. Jarrell, Jarrell. How, you know, Jarrell, as you point out, may not be showing up yet in his grades, right? The fact that Jarrell's getting this 2.7 because he's got an attitude that he can take this on, he's got agency, turns out to be a significant percentage of whether he can do college math, whether or not he got a high score on the Accuplace or measure of algebra skills, which I don't doubt is an accurate measure of the algebra skills on the day you take it. This is not about test anxiety. This is about success in life. So I feel like as we continue to unpeel that, it'll make us perhaps more open to an understanding that you need those skills. And I want to be, again, join the chorus in saying, I'm not saying having no algebra skills is a plan for success in life, especially in a lot of careers. I am saying, if you want to know who's going to continue to succeed in life, uh, their track record and their underlying sense of agency is probably super predictive. I'm excited what that might mean for lowering the number of students who get banished to perpetual uh, remedial math and never emerge. Um, again, careful, we've got to be careful that in our enthusiasm about rewarding students with the right attitudes, we don't go back to saying attitude matters, skill doesn't, because of course it does. Okay, great. James. Uh, thank thank you. Uh, let me begin by uh, thanking the Rennie Center for bringing this important uh, topic in front of us and giving us an opportunity to uh, try to find the right language to describe what it is we, we do. Um, so the question was, you know, what did I pull from um, uh, Dr. Ferguson's presentation? And, and it is the fact that we need to have a common language um, that will guide our work uh, in this particular area. Um, I, I think that one of the most important aspects of of the continuum of learning that we, we represent um, is the fact that this the, uh, social emotional development or the agency that you speak of um, is, is critical, uh, that we get a handle on it and we get a handle on it today. Um, I, I love the idea that you uh, described the, around uh, Boston basics and that is to what young parents of young children must know um, so that they can better support uh, their children uh, to make sure that those children are able to reach their uh, highest potential in life. Um, the seven C's, I, I, I love those. Uh, they make a lot of sense. And uh, from my personal experience uh, um, as, a, as an educator um, and as a representative of an organization uh, uh, deeply committed to supporting the educational um, success of students in the out of school time, um, those seven C's make a lot of sense to me. And uh, I'm going to try to learn more so that I can embed them in the work that we do. And then uh, finally, I think the issue is, um, is not to make this an add-on, uh, not to make uh, the social emotional development and learning of children an additional thing for teachers uh, and educators and administrators to learn, but to embed it and integrate it into uh, the work that, um, that those individuals do uh, with young people uh, uh, each, and, each and every day. And so, uh, Dr. Ferguson, thank you for uh, bringing agency to us. Excellent. Thank you. So I'll speak from the perspective of the uh, early education and care space as chair of the board. Um, I think just building off of uh, not just today's presentation, but conversations and work with Ron over the years, the early ed space really, if you watch children develop, you realize that in fact, the cognitive and the non-cognitive is inextricably linked. You can't do one well without the other in the early childhood space. It, it's impossible to separate them. So the language, the content, the play, all depends upon what Ron talks about, the organization of the classroom, the teacher's own ability to model uh, emotional uh, regulation, the way in which the classroom is set up and the children move from one space to another. And so what happens if you look at the research on young children's, what we're calling today, I guess, social emotional development or non-cognitive mm -hmm. skills, if you look at that research, you can't actually separate those outcomes from the quality of the settings in which they are learning and growing every day. And What's especially clear is that to get to the children in the early ed space, you have to start with the adults. And you have to think of it both as managing stress. These, this is a setting, this is a professional setting in which we have to deploy enhanced 
social emotional skills. It's not all of us here today necessarily who have to deploy nearly the emotional and behavioral regulation that the educator with uh, several young children uh, throughout the day in front of her has to uh, deploy. So we have to foster the conditions for the workforce and certainly the board has been and the agency have been focused on workforce development, most recently thinking uh, even about starting with rates that uh, as we professionalize these educators, uh, we can then move to um, initiatives that would in fact be capacity building. We've got several underway, uh, but the revisions, for example, to the quality rating improvement system give further opportunity. There's early assessment in the works to think about how to go deeper on both the measurement and uh, fostering this development of social emotional skills among both the educators and the children, given their linkages. Um, and I will say that most recently, uh, un unrelated necessarily to my board work, I was in DC and there was some a policymaker pressing on this issue of language, just why, why would we talk about non-cognitive as though it sounds like the brain is not involved and I said, well, how about everyday learning skills, right? Mm -hmm. They are everyday learning skills. That is in many ways what Ron is talking about. Great, thank, thank you all. So as, as each of you talked, I, I was thinking about words that we've been using this morning, uh, balance and integrate and shift, uh, or at least uh, incorporate. Um, so we have spent the last couple of decades really um, in making huge improvements in our educational test scores and results and, and um, we heard about where we stand as a state. Decades, and on the practice level, teachers say they don't have the supports, the training, the ability to focus on the things that we're talking about to the level and extent they'd like because we're still focused on tests and test scores. So how, from each of your perspectives, we can make this balance, make this shift? We, aren't, we don't wanna throw out the academics, we're not throwing out the test scores, but we do need to make this balance. How do we actually do that? If I could? Sure. Uh, so, um, so uh, both uh, Chris and Dr. Ferguson have indicated that academics are important um, and essential to the success of, of young people. So we don't want to throw out the academics, mm -hmm. but um, it seems to me that um, our best ability uh, to uh, make sure that our students are succeeding academically um, is uh, intimately linked to our ability to um, provide them with the social, emotional, or agency um, that they need in order to be successful in life. Um, that, um, you know, a, a person who uh, develops good, solid academic skills, if they don't have those social, emotional skills, they're not going to be successful in the world. And so I think that the two are so in, in, intricately linked. So how do we advance them? Um, by showing that the social, emotional development of young people does, in fact, uh, uh, work for them. It does, in fact, advance their academic performance. Um, it makes them better students. It gives them the rigor, the drive, the intensity um, that they need, um, while at the same time uh, also providing them with the skills to relate to others uh, and to be able to uh, work in groups, um, to be successful um, in partnership with other people. Um, I think that once we demonstrate um, to um, you know, educators and others that this is, in fact, uh, the way for us to ultimately be successful in advancing them uh, academically that, that, um, that we'll have a, a better shot at it. But first we need the language. And uh, I think that that's the first step is, is educating ourselves about, you know, uh, why this agency is important and then beginning to uh, embed that in the work itself. I think just building off of that, another, another way to think about this is that um, if you measure the quality of classroom interactions and the cognitive press, then together you get uh, folks shining a light on the social emotional skills that we're talking about today and the kind of cognitive rigor that shows up on test scores. So, you, you can also think about it as an opportunity for assessment and measurement that will 
round things out and continue to tell us what has been clear for a long time, which is this notion that you can't necessarily separate the two. Uh, if you take seriously that what we shine the light on, we pay attention to, um, that, would be, that would be the recommendation. And it can be very developmentally sensitive from the earliest of years right through to measure quality of classroom interactions and cognitive press. Yeah, I mean, I would totally agree. I mean, I think one of the, the challenges in this field, you know, it's not just language. I mean, there's also this, you know, intrapersonal versus interpersonal. I mean, the agency thing weighs all on intra, I believe. Right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and yet social emotional right. is really mostly, in my experience, really more about interpersonal in the sense of like, is there, are people treating each other well? And a lot of the social emotional programs in schools today focus more on how you treat other people than how, how hard you dig in, right? The conscientiousness and so forth. I mean, these are, you know, so first off, I think that uh, the intrapersonal shows up in academics. I don't think there's any question whatsoever that the sense of self-control, the sense of agency, you know, uh, it, 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 it's kind of unthinkable that somebody who's developing strongly in that domain will not show that, at least in grades, if not in academic, you know, in test scores and therefore, not, you know, academic knowledge. And I think there's strong evidence to that case, which is why um, a lot of folks who just want to raise student academic outcomes are very interested in agency. I mean, growth mindset is validated through test scores, uh, uh, and well, mostly through uh, grades, but also through some test scores and Carol Dweck's work and so forth. So it's not, her measure isn't, are you a happy, good human being? Her measure is, do you do better in, in math in the middle grades, right? So, you know, I think the good news is, you don't, it's not an either or, um, but it is also true, I think, that they are very complementary, right? And I feel like uh, the employer evidence is so interesting to look at. If you look at what employers rate as number one and number two, it's inter and intrapersonal. They rate, you know, what they would call work ethic typically in, in sur surveys or things like that, which might otherwise be called conscientiousness or agency or whatever, and teamwork or collaboration, yes. which is kind of interpersonal skills, right? So, you know, I, I think the good news is the intrapersonal is completely aligned. I think the greater dilemma is the interpersonal. We find in our, in our survey work at Transforming Education that schools are very interested in the interpersonal for classroom management purposes, not life success. Teachers need students who can get along with each other and get along with uh, them. And one of the reasons I think there's so much support for social emotional programming in schools, despite no direct support, you know, and no direct requirement, is it's actually pretty, uh, you, you know, pretty uh, uh, instrumental to having a classroom that's you know kind of orderly. I, last thing I'd comment on is the other thing we got to recognize is this is all on a developmental uh, spectrum. I mean, what's great about the early ed interest in this is they're not focused yet on test scores. This is one of the main readouts. Executive function, which I think you would agree with Noni, is kind of the, the intersection between uh, both the intrapersonal and interpersonal at that age clearly feeds into both. Um, you know, as you get into adolescents who begin to become self-aware and have that image of themselves, and when you can begin to ask them survey questions, because about fifth grade's the beginning of when you can really effectively ask these survey questions. What's that? Okay, you start in kindergarten, but self-awareness is, self is low in kids at a young age. Uh, anyone who's had a kid who thinks they're a good singer or, you know, or a good whatever, you know, apparently even I thought that, and if anyone's heard me sing, you know, swear, yeah. Not to, uh, but, um, you know, so you get these different developmental periods when some of these are probably more approachable. Self-control, which I think has the strongest long-term database, is probably most instrumentally sh shaped at those young ages, mm -hmm. whereas things like growth mindset, your own opinion about whether you get better because you try or not, is clearly more of kind of an adolescent, you know, uh, notion. Uh, so I think we also have to really get richer about what age and also, whose observation? Young kids, you know, the, probably the, uh, the teachers are, are, are the critical source of any data on it. I think you get to the kids old enough to be self-aware, uh, their observations on both their teachers and themselves become pretty powerful. So there's like a lot to be figured. This area is rich and really hard to sort through, but we got to get to it if we're going to sort through it. And, and uh, you know, as, as each of you talked, I'm envisioning the teachers that leave the systems um, our average uh, tenure now for teachers is less than four years. It, it may have changed slightly. And some of the reasons they tell us that they're leaving the system is because of the focus on the test scores and that they don't get the focus on these things, which drives me to the question about how we use our professional development resources and how we can create this balance over time. 
Um, those are the areas where we usually have less resources and we have less time to devote. So what do, what do we think about how we, we make the case uh, for providing the supports for our educators that they'll need to balance? Uh, because the reality is we're still looking at the test scores as, as the indicator of success. I mean, I'll just jump in with one thought on that, and, and let me make a point that one of the reasons you know this is a really valid area is some of the groups most interested in this in America are some of the highest performing charter schools. Mm -hmm. We're lucky enough at Transforming Ed, not admiring my Board of Higher Ed hat for a second, to be partnered with the, all of the, the leading charters here who are super interested in this, despite having really good test scores, because they understand that these are, you know, these are uh, both tools to help students achieve academically and uh, complementary skills to succeed in life. So that's one of the reasons I don't think there's a tension. You would think people with the highest mm -hmm. test scores would say, ah, that's soft stuff for the people who really can't get, not at all. Um, I think the question, though, of how to help students succeed at that is much less clear yet. Um, and there's some, you know, the, the what are the, the uh, you know, the paths to that. And so the question of how to use professional development time to help teachers get in a position, again, especially for, I think, you know, K-12 teachers, uh, much less college teachers, and I think of higher ed. You know what? What? What is it they can do? I mean, there's some relatively low-hanging fruit around. You know, for example, praising effort, not just outcomes and so forth, is sort of obvious stuff that you know comes out of the growth mindset mentality. But how to really change, for example, self-control? I mean, you know, the most well it's probably tested word. and mm -hmm. hard to tell whether it works or not. Uh, uh, I think, I don't know, you would know this better than me, but I think of uh, skill, tools of the mind. Yeah, that's right. Right, as one of the best tested mm -hmm. curriculums and approaches in early ed to try to, among other things, among other things, raise self-control. And, and half the RCTs of it have been negative, mm -hmm. and a couple of them have been positive. Mm -hmm. So it'd be hard to know today that you could say to folks, you know, there are people out there peddling stuff right now, say, absolutely, we know how to do all this. I'd say, we gotta get about the business of figuring out what really works. Yeah. So it's, that's part of the challenge is, I think, is not just how do we have enough PD time for it, you know, I'd say, but also how do we make sure we're telling folks stuff that actually that is they real, can, That they right? can implement that what yeah. works and that they can actually implement. Yeah, right, because, you, you know, they're, otherwise they're gonna try it out and when it doesn't work, they're, you know, like many things, they'll move on, right? And I, I think what's tricky about that that Chris is raising is that this is really in many ways about process, which is why it, in some respects, I think it hasn't hit the, hit the assessment stage necessarily and, and hasn't been as, as, as much in the focus because in many ways you are talking about processes in classrooms. So when we have effects of tools of the mind, for example, you know, you have what is a s sort of overlay on what is already needs to be there, a curriculum, right? So you have a curriculum, then you have this overlay which gives you more ideas and tools about how to deliver and enact the instruction day to day and you have a coaching component. So you're sort of into, you know, uh, to speak to this question about professional development, you're, you're really fostering the conditions by which to design and deliver uh, a higher quality learning environment every day. So are you working, you're not working just on planning, inhibitory control, uh, organization, impulse control, perspective taking, because Chris seems like he's off today. What you're enacting is a higher quality environment that is relational and that is managed by time and cognitive rigor. And so I think when you have effects, it's because it's bundled. When you don't have effects, mm. you've probably tried it in, in isolation. Sure. So I, if I could, sure. I, I think that part of the answer is plain and simply prioritizing it um, mm -hmm. and finding the funding to do it. Um, so if we look at those uh, situations where um, you know, schools have been placed into, districts have been placed into receivership, and we have turnaround plans for um, uh, the level four and five schools. In those circumstances, um, we find those schools taking, and districts taking on this issue and embedding it in their, in their work to better serve students, and they're doing it with, with, with success. And so if we can see that success, then we should continue to prioritize, and we should find the funding for it. And, and I know that, um, that this issue is gonna be uh, a subject of a deeper dive by um, the uh, DESE board in, in, in the spring um, as we begin to explore how to do this work uh, and embed this work uh, better in uh, the systems that we have in place. Excellent. Uh, Noni, I wanted to ask you, 
Mayor Walsh um, spent uh, a considerable time in his State of the City address uh, Tuesday evening on early education. And that was very, very encouraging for uh, lots of us who care deeply about this issue. So we have this opportunity and this momentum mm -hmm. with the mayor who has doubled down on his commitment to this. Um, what do you see, how do we, how do we leverage this uh, now and how do we use um, at least what he is saying publicly to advance uh, all of the issues we've talked about this morning? Well, I think there is, you know, tremendous momentum around pre-K, uh, not just in Boston, but nationally, and uh, it certainly is an opportunity. Um, the board here in Massachusetts is very actively thinking not just about access, but quality. So mm -hmm. what we want to be clear, what we want to be clear about, and certainly what I want to be sure about is that we're advocating as Mayor Walsh is, uh, we're advocating for high quality pre-K. And so mm -hmm. what we then are, are left with is to think about how to take a model like Boston, which has, uh, you know, created synergies between the district and the mixed delivery community-based mm -hmm. providers, has created alignment with respect to curriculum, has employed coaching, has done a lot of fundraising to implement mm -hmm. that model, and think through with the resources and the expanse of the universe with respect to early ed, how to, how to think through the kind of expansion that folks are calling for, which in my mind is expansion of only the high quality early education mm -hmm. and care. And so I, I would leave, you know, I would leave us all with that as the, the real challenge as we think this through uh, as a city and as a state. Excellent. So James, um, the report really outlined uh, some very promising examples of good practice. Um, how do we actually replicate them in a systematic way and in a way that they're sustained? I think so much uh, of innovation is, here's a great model, but then when you try to actually incorporate it and sustain it and integrate it long term, uh, that's where the challenges come, the funding drops and so on. So you are always out there fundraising. Mm -hmm. How do we sustain some of these innovative models? Um, so uh, as I looked at those models, uh, I, I, there were some common themes. And one of the common themes was the uh, public-private partnership. Um, the partnership between your public school uh, uh, schools um, and your community-based organizations. And I think that one way to sustain this work is to make sure that we uh, continue to support uh, that partnership, making sure that uh, there's a recognition that the schools themselves can't do the, to the whole job, and that there are community-based organizations that have lots of expertise to be able to support uh, the academic success of students in the out-of-school time, uh, the evenings, the summers, the vacations, um, and to make sure that those uh, partnerships are supported in whatever way, ways that we can um, and and um, to Noni's point, making sure that the community-based organizations that are providing those services are providing high-quality uh, service that um, uh, really is supporting the children and families that, that we're uh, responsible for, for serving. So I think one of the ways to sustain it is to make it in each of the communities where uh, this is an issue, uh, and it's an issue in many communities throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, where our goal is to make sure that every, every uh, child, not just some children, have the opportunity for uh, academic uh, success, um, that we have to make sure that those partnerships are, are supported um, so that the work can continue at the highest possible levels. Great, thank you. So um, this is a question for each of you because in each of our systems, each of the areas that you're responsible for, uh, we continue, no matter how much progress we have made, and we've made good progress, we continue to have persistent gaps in achievement, color, culture, language. Um, and that's depressing <laughs> that we think we've made so much progress, but yet we continue to see these gaps. Uh, if you each would speak in your areas, um, what do you... What do you see as next steps to tackle the persistent gaps? 
I mean, let me comment on one because I think it connects what we can do in policy and, uh, you know, initiative to the topic of uh, these social emotional and, and non cognitive skills. And I want to talk about one non cognitive or social emotional skill that, you know, has been uh, the subject of a lot of look at, uh, discussion in terms of college success, and that's uh, belonging uncertainty. So uh, it's intuitively obvious that some students, like my kids, somewhat arrogantly believe they belong on a college campus. Their pa parents went to college, they go to a college nearby, they're sure they belong. And they bump through, go through their early bumps without much doubt. A lot of kids arrive, particularly first generation students, particularly the students you're speaking exactly to in my mind, not so sure they belong. And then a wonderful New York Times Magazine article by Paul Tuff on this issue started off with a wonderful anecdote about this young woman who goes, shows up at University of Texas Austin and does poorly on her first test, calls home, and her mom said, "I knew you should. You were just co community college material." Mm -hmm. Now I'm not saying that with like, I'm looking at my, one of my colleagues from community college. This is not said as a denigration of community college, but that's a hell of a message. And I, you know, you felt terribly for that girl, and you know, for that mom. Understandably, that was her frame of reference. Tough message to hear. You know, you didn't do well in your first test, you shouldn't, you don't belong there, right? We know that what students can do a lot better when they believe they belong. What can we do about that? You know, Chad, you brought it out. I mean, early college is an incredibly powerful tool for helping students who might not otherwise know that their college material, know their college material, get through college more affordably, you know, uh, and align what high school and college are supposed to be aligning anyways. So this question of, for example, can we reach across silos to say, as we need to across this whole spectrum, by the way, now that I'm involved as the board chair of higher education, I've learned that you all are doing lower <laughs> education. I've been working in the dinner of the day, you're in K-12, I never do that about myself. She's but dealing with the baby. Yeah, she's at the lowest, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but that's a different aside. But, you know, I think the opportunity to think Each about, yeah, uh, you're gonna speak after me, so that was a really bad idea on my part. Uh, but um, I think it's an opportunity to say, how do we break through that? And it's something that uh, the board chairs and the commissioners and the secretary and we have been talking about, like what would it take for Massachusetts to, to solve that problem, which is a realistic problem of institutions and financial schemes and expectations, it's not easy, but we have some great examples in our state of programs, uh, including people who are represented here today, who've been reaching across that divide. And by giving students unlikely to succeed college statistically, that jump start there's pretty good evidence that those students Absolutely. do better, right, simply by changing, I think, more than anything else, their sense of confidence and belonging, this non-cognitive thing, not necessarily by raising their, their, their measurable skills, although I'm sure that happens too. So that makes me excited about what we can do if we start thinking more about how students succeed, not how institutions succeed. If I can just put a plug in for that, Chris, uh, I think visiting college campuses, all kinds of college campuses, throughout the educational career of students from preschool right up until high school is a huge um, step forward. And that's not an expensive step to say every single Boston middle school student will visit two college campuses. We have 38 of them in Boston. It's no reason that these colleges won't open their doors and create programs. And so if they do that, think about it. If they visited eight or 10 college campuses during their school career, they already have a sense of, they, I can be here, I can belong here. It certainly can contribute to that. So I, I totally agree with you and, and support that. James, your thought about um, So um, the, the Board of uh, Elementary and Secondary Ed, we are um, extremely proud of the fact that um, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has the best public education system uh, in the country, and one of the best in the world. Proud of that. Um, however, as a board, we're not satisfied with that. Um, uh, we have made a commitment uh, to address um, the challenges of those, those uh, of our students who um, are not doing as well as others. Uh, we want uh, every child to experience uh, uh, success uh, academically, uh, in college, and in life. And so we have a focus on this particular issue um, as a board, and that is uh, serving those who are not uh, having the same level of success as, as others. And um, so what we do um, as a board is we're uplifting those strategies, uh, uplifting those school districts, and uplifting those schools that are uh, successful in this work. 
um, and uh, using them as an example of just what can be accomplished uh, in, other, in other communities and helping to connect uh, those successful uh, strategies um, uh, with um, school districts that are struggling. And so um, there are programs that are being implemented like the Springfield Empowerment Zone Partnership uh, where we're bringing in a number of um, experts, uh, educational experts into the middle schools to support those middle schools in their ability to uh, serve uh, uh, children who are struggling today. Um, and we will continue to uplift that as a, as a viable strategy. Um, I also think that um, uh, one of the ways that we can address this issue uh, even better than we are today um, goes back to a point that I made earlier. Um, because I have the opportunity to see what happens when um, schools and community-based organizations do partner around serving uh, children. Uh, those children almost always uh, improve uh, their academic success. And so I think that one of the things that we can do is to uh, develop these uh, partnerships between schools and community-based organizations and, and do it with intentionality, uh, taking, again, the best practices of those partnerships uh, and replicating those throughout uh, throughout the Commonwealth. Um, you know, let's take uh, you know Boston Basics, uh, as uh, Dr. Ferguson said. Let's take that strategy throughout the Commonwealth and and show the benefits that it can have in other communities that are struggling. And then um, and then lastly, um, I think that it's important for us to um, take a singular focus on summer learning loss. Um, it is said that 70% of the achievement gap is based upon summer slide. And so if we can get a handle on that particular aspect uh, of the challenge um, by providing children uh, during the summer with opportunities to develop their academic skills uh, while at the same time being enriched in supporting their agency, I think that ultimately we'll, we'll uh, get a better handle uh, on the, uh, the achievement gap uh, challenge. Um, by the way, um, there are some of us who don't believe it's an achievement gap. Uh, we believe it's an opportunity gap. Um, at those times when we provide our children with the opportunities uh, that other children in more resource communities receive, uh, those children almost invariably uh, experience uh, success. Noni? Um, I'll make two points, one briefly because I've touched on it already, but uh, central to, this, to these issues of uh, disparities by groups is, of course, access to high quality early education and care, and, and this, this is really where the rubber hits the road, which is to say you cannot argue with the data that looks long-term at the effects of, of high quality early education and care, that when, when you do deliver that cognitively rigorous, uh, emotionally attuned, warm, um, high-paced learning environment, we see real growth on really critical indicators of health and development. So we're not, we, we're not necessarily there looking for innovation. We're just thinking more about how to bring that to scale, how to develop a workforce that can deliver that in, in this space. But the second point I'll make, which because it ha particularly since it hasn't come up this morning, is some of the very promising work is also, of course, two generational, which is to say that we don't just serve children, we serve children and their families. Yes. And some of the very strong data coming out of the early education and care space is really around two generational programs and initiatives, that when you stabilize families and provide high quality learning opportunities, uh, of course, there's much more purchase. When you have policies that are not just supportive of children's learning, but take into account the effects on the adult and their opportunities for capacity building and workforce development, we see much more purchase. So I uh, just want to bring in partnering with families in ways that are tangible, not simply uh, in community-based ways. Excellent. Well, we are being told to wrap up. I um, think you all had, can um, feel how fortunate we are in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to have these exceptional leaders uh, in charge of our educational system. So I ask that you join me in thanking them for their work and their commitment and participating on this panel. Yeah.